So you're the brave few here today. <laughs> Beautiful weather. So uh, <clears throat> today will be two parts, and I hope we could do, do a bit shorter break because I have a lot of material after the break. So we can do it five, 10 minutes max break. So, so we'll start with uh, visualization. So we have been doing drawing plots using Matplotlib now. And uh, today I will show you a tool uh, and also a library for generating visualizations that you can visualize using a special application called Paraview. Uh, so these slides are from the Paraview site, which is a, a American university project. So it's an open source project. Uh, and I will go through some of the concepts of this application. So Paraview is an open source application for uh, that can be run on Windows, Mac, Linux, supercomputers. It's a really large application. Uh, it supports distributed computation so that you can, the visualization algorithm can be executed on multiple computers. Uh, it has a very open and flexible user interface. It can be somewhat like the space shuttle if you look at it first, but I hope I can show you some of the concepts so it, it becomes natural, the, the workflow of the application. It's very extensible. So it has a lot of uh, plugins that can load um, uh, different file formats. It can also save in different file formats. Uh, it can do a lot of uh, algorithms on data as well. Some of the outputs from this application you can see here. So you can see here that you can do really large models. It can do uh, Visualize flow lines on fluid dynamics simulation. It can do stress visualization uh, and many more of these things. So it's quite powerful application. <clears throat> so it's used by governments, virtual institutions worldwide. It's downloaded a lot. This slide's a bit updated, but it has got a lot of awards. Um, so it's a good tool to to use. And also remember, it's free. So there is no license cost. So if you start working, you can always download Paraview and use it for visualization. Uh, it can handle huge data sets. So these, these are numbers from a couple of years ago, but you can see here that it's billion structural cells, 250 million uh, billion unstructured cells. And it can do that basically almost in real time. So you can, you can just move around this data and look at them, even if they are quite large. Uh, the architecture looks like this. Uh, in the bottom here, you can see here we have OpenGL, which is a hardware acceleration library uh, that is used in gaming, but also in uh, other fields. And it's an abstraction layer that enables you to do hardware accelerated graphics. MPI is for parallel programming. We'll not use that in this course. And there are some other communication libraries. And on top of that, there's something called VTK, which stands for Visualization Toolkit, which is a C++ library for visualization. It's somewhat like QT, but for visualization. And on top of that, we have the Paraview server and then the user interface. And what we're going to use in this course is the Paraview client. So this is an application that builds upon these layers and provides you with a, a way of visualizing data sets in different ways. Let me skip this one here. Because here it's, it's funded by several large laboratories in the US and also involved in the XSA computing project for which for simulating really large uh, data or uh, problems. <clears throat> so, so what is visualization? So you have a, all of you have uh, been doing these reports, printing out numbers uh, from your from your simulations. And uh, you, you have this kind of data set here and you want to make sense of that data. And visualization is, the, is going from numbers to something that you can look at and analyze with your eyes. So this case here is a flow field around the space shuttle. And you can see where you have high pressures and low pressures. Paraview <laughs> you can handle as a basic set of a data structure for visualization that you can Build upon. You have the uh, rectilinear data sets, basically uh, rows and columns and depths of 
of regularly spaced elements. So it's a bit like a regular finite element mesh. Non-uniform means that you have, uh, you can set the different sizes of the elements um, in the model as well. You can have curved linear, same structure here, but you have a curve. You can have poly uh, poly uh, polygonal, which is kind of unstructured data. Uh, and then you can have a mix uh, of different elements in the same. And these are the basic things that you read into Paraview, and then you can work with this data structure to produce visualizations. Uh, so instead of uh, going through a lot of slides, I, I will show you the application instead. We will walk through it and how it's, it's built up. So let's switch to the application. So this is the Paraview application. On top, you have the menu. It's very similar to any other application here. You have open, save, and so on. Um, on the left side here, you have something called a pipeline browser. And the pipeline browser is here. You build up your the visualization workflow. So you start by loading a data set, then you add filters and uh, different operations on this data to produce a visualization. Below here, it's similar to what you have in the designer here, you have properties, uh, you, can, you can have information as well about the selected part of your pipeline. Then on top here, you have, uh, you can modify the view here. In this case, we are looking at the X, uh, X and Y view and the C axis in, into the screen. And here you can control the view in different aspects here as well. There's also one important button here that you should use a lot. This is the reset button. So there is no, um, you're not working in a document. You're working in a, um, you load in data and you work with it. And uh, you can save the session data, but um, when you want to start from the beginning, you press the reset button here. It will erase everything in, in your uh, view. So Paria works with, you can have sources of data that could be your text files, your uh, 3D models that you want to read in. Those are called sources. And you can look here, here that there is a lot of sources here that you can read in. So these are generated data that is generated by uh, Paraview, but you can also uh, import open. <coughs> so if you look at the bottom screen here, the bottom open dialog here, uh, you can see here all the supported file formats that you can, you can read into Paraview. So it can read almost any three-dimensional result find from any uh, simulation application. You can read uh, Excel files uh, and, and everything you can think about, you can read in. But just to show you how you can use the application, I will just create a source and I use, you can do search here, you can type sphere. And now nothing happened. The only thing happened was that I added a sphere object to my pipeline. And you can see also that the eye is closed. Uh, and that is something that, uh, especially for Paraview, because Paraview usually handles really large data sets. And often you want to operate on the pipeline before actually visualizing it because you want to do steps um, because they are so expensive to execute. So it waits for you to change things before it actually draws things. So if you want to show the screen or the sphere, you press apply. And you can see here that I have a, a really ugly sphere here. And in Paraview, uh, you have uh, a number of different representations of, of your data. Uh, the default one is the surface. It displays the surface of your object that you have read in. You can also do surface with edges. So here you can see uh, which surfaces it's built up on. In this case, you can see here there are uh, triangle faces here that makes up this sphere. You can also do points. It's too difficult to see here, but you can see there are small points that uh, points of this sphere. You can do uh, outline that just shows you the outline of data. You're not interested in looking 
add the data, just kind of the extent. Um, you can do wireframe as well, just show the, the edges of the triangles. And you also see that it's, the, now we just wear the sphere, there is no data attached to the sphere. And we can man manipulate this sphere here as well. So you can see here in the properties, the radius is 0 0.5. If I press one here and press apply, sphere is made larger. Uh, you can zoom in and out here using the right key of the mouse. You can also change the resolution here. So I will just do like this. Uh, 16 by 16. And now you can see you can get more. Sphere. So in the properties here, you can affect things in the right side of the screen. I can also change the color of the object here. So I can do a red sphere like this. Uh, I can do specular here means that you make it more uh, shiny. It makes like plastic. So if I increase this one here, you can see here that I get some uh, specular lighting here. It's a bit more reflective. Uh, so that is a sphere. Then you can, on this sphere or this object here, I can apply something called filters that modify the data. Uh, and you can see here we have filters here. And if I do alphabetical here, you can see that there are, you can do a lot with it. It's a really large menu. Uh, but the one nice thing here, if you press control space in power view, it brings up a search box. So if you start typing here, I can do, uh, let's see here. Shrink. So now I will uh, apply a filter called shrink, which will shrink the elements of the of the sphere, the, the triangles. And I press the button. Here. You see, it added uh, another filter to the pipeline. And let's see here, the shrink factor here is zero point five. So if I press apply now, it should um, create. Uh, triangles of half the size. So this is a, yeah. so you work through here, you have a sphere, and you can see also that the sphere original object is turned off. I can turn that on as well if I want to. And now it's there in the same kind of, so you get kind of interference here, but uh, you can turn the different things in the pipeline on and off. You can, of course, also set the color um, of the uh, of the new objects here to blue, for example. And then I press. Oh, wrong. So, but this is just an academic example here, how you can move around, you can zoom in and out. Uh, you can also uh, press the different here to, to look at the different axis views here on top like this. You can also zoom in here, uh, zoom to data. So if you yeah. zoom out like this and you want to find your data again, it will zoom in. Uh, same thing with, with this one here, it will zoom to reset the zoom view again to the original view. So uh, to do some scientific visualization, you need a, a data set that has built-in uh, data structures uh, or, or data. Uh, and data can be attached to the nodes. It can be attached to the element. Uh, and you can have scalar values and you can have vector values that can attach to different points in, in the data structure. So I will press reset here now. Now you can see here it will reset power view to its original state, empty. And now it will load an example file here. Examples. Same thing here now. You can see here that it read it in and it shows you uh, the fields that are 
present in this uh, data set. Uh, and you can see here that there are temperature, there are pressures, there are uh, vectors here for speed and uh, and our velocity. So if I want to look at the data now, I can just press apply. Now I have here a cylinder here with a hole in it. And it's actually a container here, which is heated here in the middle, but you can't see anything because I'm just looking at the surface here. So if I want to look at the data, uh, we need to uh, select which parameter we want to look at. So now it says solid color here. And now we switch that to temperature. Now we can see it turn blue. So the outside of the cylinder is uh, uh, 20, 290 degrees. And you can see here inside that there is something is hot in this inside here. So what do we do about this? So we want to look inside of this cylinder here to look at the dis uh, temperature distribution. What we can do then, we can take our cutting tool, this one here, uh, or clip. Keep this selected here, press clip. You can see here that it adds a object uh, filter to the pipeline. And then it shows you uh, the clipping plane that we want to clip to. And if we go to the property <laughs> here, you can uh, clip on different, or so we can do uh, different directions, X, Y, and Z. So we'll keep X here. And when we do visualization here, we don't want to show the plane here, so we uncheck this one and we apply. So now I have cut this uh, data set in two, and you can see here that we have this, uh, where, where, the heat, where we have the heat. Uh, what we also want to do, or what you can do, uh, if you press this one here, I said it, it's turned off by default. Uh, what we can do is actually make that transparent. So there is a, a scaling our capacity. And we can make this so we can see through here. Uh, and next thing we want to do is to add uh, uh, look at the, the flow inside this cylinder. So then we have to um, we select the outer body here again. And then we will use uh, something called a stream tracer. <coughs> and we will uh, change it to... And here you can see here, the stream tracer will release uh, streamlines into the flow. And, and you can see the flow flowing inside the model. And here it's, it requires you to select the vector field, which we have, V. Uh, and then we want to select the point, uh, point cloud. Well, and this, this sphere here shows you where it will release the streamlines. We will make it a bit bigger. Oh, I forgot. Now uh, we've already released my, I will make it three. Um, like that. And we remove the sphere here. I will just click on it. So here you can see that it released the streamlines uh, on the hot surface here. You can see it flows up here. But it's a bit unclear, difficult to see. So uh, to make the streamlines appear a bit more uh, solid, we can apply uh, to the stream, trace, stream tracer. We can add a filter called a tube. And we can see here, we just try the default ones. So now the streamlines became solid tubes. You can also change the, the color uh, scale. So in this case here, if you want to have a color the streamlines uh, uh, with the velocity instead of the temperature, we can just select here velocity and the magnitude. So now you can see here that the, 
the velocity is coloring the stream maps. We can also uh, change the color scale. And here is the similar what, how to, to map that here. We can do uh, the streamlines, we use them to be look at this. Now the streamlines have a different color scale, that's from the temperature. We also make them a bit cleaner <coughs> here. That was the radius of the internal sphere. Um, it's a, a tube. We can make them a little specular and we can do radius a bit smaller here. So this is how we can use this application. We can also do, for example, we can do the select the clip here and make that a bit transparent as well. So we can see through the entire tube like this. So in this way you can take data and you can slice it, and you can cut it, and you can visualize different aspects of the data in, in very, many powerful ways. So now, now we ask the question, how do we get the data from our program? To, to be to vary. So let's try this. Yes. So I have provided a lecture here uh, that you can also open and use if you want to use that. Let's see here. Yes. So there is a module called 5ETK, which you should have, uh, if you install Calfem, it should be already installed. Uh, and this is a module that can take data and convert it to a special file format called VTK, which you can use to um, import into uh, Paris. And it, it uses these data structures, just like I showed before, as the base. So what I do now is just install this here in this notebook. So we'll just go through some simple examples here. And uh, so you, you can import it using statement up here. So from 5 to k import star. Then you have uh, different classes available to you to create uh, the data structure that you want to visualize. So in this case here, I have a data structure called polydata. It consists of uh, uh, six points and polygons defined by these points here. So this is the basic, the, the geometry, the structure of what you want to visualize. Then you have to attach data to your structure. So in this case here, I have a, uh, I create something called point data. Uh, and you can see here I add some scalars just from zero to seven here, uh, which should be placed on the, on the six points. So each point here will get a scalar value. Then you can also, it's really nice, you can, you can give it a name so that we, when you open it in, in Paraview, you can identify uh, which data that you have. You can also define data on the each element. So basically that is your, for example, your uh, stress or your flow, maximum flow in the element. And you can add scalars to your elements. You can add normals here. This is done for visualization purposes. You can have field data, some other attributes here. And you can attach them all to the 
So now, I have, now we have the structure, we have point data, we have cell data. Now we have to combine this to a, a BTK structure. And that's what you do here. You have BTK data, you add the structure, you add the point data, and you add the cell data. And then you can do BTK.25. This will save uh, this example here as ASCII. So by default, uh, BTK is a text file with a special structure. But you can also save it as a binary here. If you have large data set, you can do it as binary. And if you look at this file here, this is how it looks. So this has a, a header here called VTK data file version two. That's something strange here. And then you have, it's ASCII, and then you have data set color data. Here are put, uh, eight points. And here are the polygons to find, cell data, normals, so PyVTK uh, takes the complexity of generating these files. <laughs> it's much easier to generate these files of memory. And I can um, download this file here. So I'm going to go back to Mario. I'm going to here I have my BTK file. I open it. And now we should have a queue with some data attached to it. So now you can see here you have a queue. You can see here it's colored by the sample scalar. So these are the scalar values attached to the, the points of the queue. So you can see here that I have the maximum value was seven, which was consistent to what we had when we provided it. And we have the lowest value was zero. So you can see here that the cube is from color from blue to red here, depending on the, the values I attached. I also attached cell data. So now we have certain representation, but I can color it. Uh, the cell ID is that there's a different cells here. So we have four polygons here. Uh, I can also, the cell scalars here that are attached to each of the polygons here, also visible now. Um, so, but the important thing is, it's a, uh, it's a good idea to name your data so that you can see what field is, is, is displayed. So next example here uh, is a bit different here. We have structured points. That is, we have a, a block of cells uh, with three rows, four columns, and six depth and depth. Another word called depth. And then, so this is three by four by six values. And then I attach point data directly here and just add a lot of scalar values to this <laughs> structure. So this could be. Um, similar to what you have, a finite element with uh, the temperatures on the nodes. Yeah. So the scalars here are temperatures. Also. Now I have example two. Go back to the panel view. So now it looks like I um, just show some outline here. So it doesn't actually show anything, just the outline of the data. But I want to just, so let's see here, we do surface with edges. 
Here you can see the structure. We have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we attach values to each of the nodes here. Uh, but we have, now we can see here we are displaying solid colors. So we need to display the scalars. Now you can see here that we have scalars here uh, displayed. And now it, this is actually a volume data here. So if we do a, a cut here, uh, apply. You can look inside here, there are actual values inside this block as well. And we can, we can move this in different ways here and cut the block and look inside here. So that was structure data. Then we can also do uh, use existing data. So here in this case here, we load example 2.btk and we have a parameter here, keep the structure. So we just load the structure. We don't load the data. And then we have a function here that calculates the value. And then we create btk structure scalars, f, and then we name it here to this. So it will actually compute uh, the value here based on the coordinates of the data. Will look very familiar to the last example here. So <coughs> I didn't talk about this. Should be there. like this. And now you can see we have the same structure here, like before. But if you look at, um, now it's a formula that's calculated here. So we have uh, the highest value, of course, where x, y, and z are the highest coordinate values. And then it's uh, blue and below it. So, so you can use a function here to compute the values in this. <coughs> and then we have a, a much larger example here. This is the unstructured data set. We have points, we have vectors here. So we can also visualize vector fields. Uh, and here we create an unstructured grid. We give it the points. We create hexahedrons here from the points, tetrahedrons, polygons, triangle strips, Towards triangle lines and vertices. So here you can combine any data structures. And then we attach uh, point data. We have vectors at the points, and we also have scalars here, uh, 27 of them attached to the points here. And we run this one here. Reset. 
So this looks a bit strange here. We have a um, There are many different structures here. You have tetrahedrons here, you have normal uh, triangles here, so on. And, uh, now I'm visualizing the scalars here, but I can also visualize the vectors. And what I can do then is I can add a filter here to, uh, it's called a glyph filter. Uh, and the glyph filter with uh, a line uh, symbol at each point here that has a vector and align that symbol in that vector direction. And you can see here the orientation array is the vectors uh, and the scale is the scale of the vectors, scale by magnitude. Uh, and then we will have, <coughs> so you can choose here to, if you have a really large data set with millions of vectors, perhaps you don't want to visualize every vector, you want to visualize a distribution of them. So here you can say every end point uh, universe spatial distribution, surface sampling, volume sampling. So it, uh, in, in this case, we just have a few of vectors, so we could survive this. So we do all points, apply. Now you can see here that it displays the vectors here with arrows scaled with the magnitude of the vector. You can, of course, um, can change the scale here as well. It's also possible to, uh, so now we, the, the arrows here are 3D objects. If you have a lot of uh, vectors, it could be beneficial to use a 2D glyph. And then you can see here it uses a line-based examples of the, of the vector. And I can also, I think I can change the glyph. Somewhere. I can do lines here as well. And, and uh, when you will do your, um, in, in, the, in the final worksheet, there is a section of how to do visualization, how to export your data. What you have to do is you have to export two vector fields, one for the first principle stress, uh, if you have a stress problem. First principle and the second principle. And then you have to combine them together to, to display them in this. So that, that is what we're going to do. We will export uh, the, the displacement field and the stress, principal stresses uh, and the basis stresses to the VTK file. And if you have a scalar problem, you will export the node values and perhaps also the maximum flow values uh, or the flow inside element as well. It's also possible to export. So that was the. Skip that one. Mm -hmm. I'll we'll also show. Mm -hmm. So here, um, this is the part where we, in the worksheet here, exporting to VTK files. Uh, in this case, I, I use import PyVTK as VTK, uh, just to kind of not conflict with other classes here. Uh, and we are going to use uh, polydata. And the idea is that we implement a function in your uh, results here to actually export the results uh, to find them here. And then we have from the EDOF here, we create the polygons. And unfortunately, uh, PyVTK doesn't take NumPy array. Here. <laughs> so we need to convert them to lists. So when we have this array here, we do two lists to export. We have polygon here, 
that is the topology view. Um, oh, sorry, but this is the, if you have the um, stress, we use this one here. But then we do point data and we attached, um, we have, uh, in this case, we have the uh, nodal values, uh, let's see here, here, A to list, full at pressure. We have cell data here, max flow, full max flow here. We have cell data here, for the Mises stresses, for example, add us to Mises. Uh, and then we create polydata points, points, and then we have polygons, polygons, and then we combine it together, structure, point data, and cell data. And we save it to disk. Now I will show you how it can look. Just take one, one uh, so this is a uh, parametric uh, run as well from the from, so we will generate one um, uh, BTK file for each uh, step in the each parameter value. And the thing is that if you have a lot of files that are named with numbers like this, uh, BTK can load them all into the same visualization. And you can see here, it's 2D model here. And uh, on top of the screen here, you can actually move between the different data uh, solutions here. You can also animate like this. So now it displays um, the Formisa stresses <laughs> in the uh, elements here. But you can see here, I also have one principle one and one principle two here. Uh, so I will add a vector field here to this uh, visualization. So what I will do then is I will add here a glyph visualization. Uh, I will use principle, scalar right principle one. Uh, and let's see what happens here. Okay, there are two big probably. <laughs> And I would use uh, nine here. So you can see here that uh, I have some arrows here. And I will also change the colors of those to solid color like this. So now I have the one principal stress. So I will add a second one. So I click this one again here, the top one, uh, because I you, if you want to add a field, you have to uh, select the source first. If I select this, the glyph source, uh, output from the glyph will only be lines. So that would be kind of not useful. So we need to select param stress here again. Select another glyph here. We select orientation array principle two, scale array principle two, want to scale it like this. Then we do uh, apply. Okay, we have a line here again. Apply. And we have a problem here now. Uh, let's see over here. Um, this, this, these stresses shouldn't be as large. They should be smaller because we are pulling in this direction. Problem is that we have two different scale factors for the different vector fields. So if we look at the first one here, You can see here that I have a scale factor here of something like this. So what I do, I, I copy that scale factor and I go over to the second glyph here and I paste that in. And now we have the correct scaling of the, the principal stresses. And you can animate those as well. 
Can you go away, please? Okay. And also, one thing to note is that uh, if you have an animation with multiple uh, BTK files, uh, the, scale, the values will be scaled on all of them. So the max value will actually be the max value of all the simulations, all the values in this, all of these that you have imported. So, oh, exception to the break. So uh, uh, I will continue after the break. Mm -hmm.